Okay, let's open our Bibles. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 16. And by God's grace, it looks like we are going to finish this letter as we study verses 13 through 24. 1 Corinthians 16, verses 13 through 24. Let me read our text, and then let's together dig into our text. Starting in verse 13, the Apostle Paul gave a series of commands to the Corinthians where he said to them, Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Act like men, be strong, and let all that you do be done in love. Now I urge you, brethren, you know the household of Stephanus, that they were the first fruits of Achaia, and that they have devoted themselves for ministry to the saints, that you also be in subjection to such men and to everyone who helps in the work and labors. I rejoice over the coming of Stephanus and Fortunatus and Achaicus, because they have supplied what was lacking on your part. For they have refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, acknowledge such men. The churches of Asia greet you. Aquila and Prisca greet you heartily in the Lord with the church that is in their house. All the brethren greet you. Greet one another with a holy kiss. The greeting is in my own hand, Paul. If anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. Maranatha, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. My love be with you all. In Christ Jesus, amen. This is God's holy inspired, authoritative word of truth. And all of God's people say, Amen. Okay, well, as you can see on the screen behind me, today is part two, where we are taking a look at Paul's concluding comments. As he was bringing this letter to the Corinthians, as he was bringing this letter to a close, Paul's concluding comments. And it's here in our text for today, and I'm going to ask you to underline, that Paul talks about a specific group of people. If you want to underline in verse 19, we see two names, Aquila and Prisca, or some of your Bible versions say Priscilla. We already met them way back when, when we started this letter, but today we're going to talk a little about them as well as Paul brings this letter to a close. Aquila and Prisca. If you want to hop over to verse 17, we see three other people. We see Stephanus. We already met him as well, way back in chapter 1. I'll remind you of him a little later. We see Stephanus, and by the way, his name means one who wears a crown, though he wasn't a king or any sort of royalty, Stephanus. We see another two names, Fortunatus. In the Latin, it means the blessed one. We don't know who Fortunatus was. We see a third person, Achaicus which literally means in the Greek, one from the providence of Achaia. We don't know who he is. We know who Stephanus was. We don't know exactly who Fortunatus and Achaicus were, but I think we're going to be able to figure out at least maybe the role that they had in that church in Corinth. So, We're going to talk about Aquila and Prisca. We're going to talk about Stephanus. Try to understand who Fortunatus and Achaicus possibly were. But I also want you to take a look at verse 22. Would you please underline three words there? 
where Paul, as he closes this letter, says, if anyone does not, would you underline, love the Lord? Paul says that person is to be accursed. Would you underline the word accursed? And then we read this word, and again, would you underline it, Maranatha, which is an Aramaic expression, which means come Lord Jesus or Lord Jesus come. In verse 22, Paul says, if anyone does not love the Lord, he is to be accursed. And then he says, come Lord Jesus or Maranatha. What exactly was Paul saying there? We'll see that a little later as well. Well, if you've been with us through this letter, we've been going through this letter, I want to say probably about a year and a half. It is a challenging letter to teach because <laughs> there's so many things going on and ugh, challenging, but also a challenging letter to learn because again, there are so many things going on, but I really uh, applaud your patience, your diligence, and your desire to dig deep into God's Word. I think it's fair to say that we've all learned a ton as we've made our way chapter by chapter, actually verse by verse, chapter by chapter, through this letter. Well, today, again, by God's grace, we're going to bring this letter to a close. And as we begin digging into the last part of this letter, let's first focus on these people, just so we can get a clear picture of who they were. Aquila and Priscilla, or Prisca. Um, go to Acts chapter 18. Again, way, way back, when we first started this letter, I kind of did a uh, background teaching on Paul in Corinth, how the church was founded, uh, Paul's ministry there in Corinth. And just as a reminder, here in chapter 18, we are told, after these things, verse 1, Paul left Athens and went to Corinth. Again, as a reminder, this was during Paul's second missionary trip, where he actually started up in the northern part of Greece, in the region of Macedonia, where Paul planted churches in Philippi, Thessalonica, and Berea. He then made his way down south, stopping in Athens, and then after Athens, he made his way down to Corinth, the region of Achaia. Well, verse 2, we are told that when Paul arrived there, he found a Jew named, there it is, Aquila, who was a native of Pontus, having recently come from Italy with his wife Priscilla or Prisca. Why? Because Claudius, the emperor at that time, had commanded all the Jews to leave Rome. Paul came to them, Aquila and Prisca. Why? Well, verse 3, he was of the same trade as they were. They were tent makers. Paul was a tent maker. That's how Paul supported himself and his ministry partners there in Corinth. Now, he did receive additional support from other churches, but Paul primarily supported his ministry and the, his ministry partners by being a tent maker. Well, Aquila and Priscilla were also tent makers. So when Paul arrived in Corinth, he found them. They had something in common. We're told he stayed with them and they were working for by trade, they were tent makers. And Paul was reasoning in the synagogue every Sabbath and trying to persuade Jews and Greeks. 
That's Paul's, the beginning of Paul's ministry in Corinth. He immediately met Aquila and Prisca, husband and wife team who had been kicked out of Italy and landed down in Corinth. Well, after Paul spent a year and a half in Corinth, planted a church, discipled the people in the church, hop over to verse 18. Paul remained many days longer there in Corinth, a year and a half, and then he left. He took leave of the brethren, the people in the church in Corinth, and he put out to sea for Syria, and guess who left with him? Priscilla and Aquila. In Censoria, Paul had his hair cut. He was keeping a vow. Verse 19, they came to Ephesus. Paul, Aquila, and Priscilla. They came to Ephesus. And Paul left them there. And he continued on, eventually making his way back to Antioch, his home base, where he would launch out on his missionary journeys. So after ministering in Corinth for a year and a half, Aquila and Priscilla were with him. The three of them left. They quickly stopped in Ephesus. Paul left them there in Ephesus, and he continued on. Now, while they were in Ephesus, over in verse 24, they met a Jew named Apollos, who would eventually become the pastor of the church in Corinth. Why? The church needed a pastor. Paul had left. They met a Jew named Apollos in Alexandria by birth. He was an eloquent man who had come to Ephesus. Again, Paul left. Priscilla Quiller there. Apollos shows up, and he was mighty in the scriptures. Verse 25, this man had been instructed in the way of the Lord. He was fervent in spirit. He was speaking and teaching accurately the things concerning Jesus, but... He was only acquainted with the baptism of John. John the Baptist, who prepared the way for the Messiah, declaring, repent, the Messiah is coming. Well, Apollos was preaching that. Because he didn't know the rest of the story, that the Messiah had come. And that's why, verse 26, he began to speak out boldly in the synagogue there in Ephesus. But when Priscilla and Aquila heard him, they took him aside and they explained to him the way of God more accurately. In other words, that the Messiah had come. Well, Apollos humbled himself. He listened and learned. In verse 27, when he wanted to go across from Ephesus to Achaia, the church in Corinth, who needed a pastor because Paul had left, the brethren encouraged him and wrote to the disciples there in Corinth to welcome him. And when he arrived, he greatly helped those who believed through grace, for he was powerfully, re for he powerfully refuted the Jews in public demonstrating by the scriptures that Jesus was the Christ. So a brief reminder for you of who Aquila and Prisca were, husband and wife team, who served with Paul a year and a half in Corinth when Paul founded and discipled the church. They left with Paul as he left Corinth he left them there in Ephesus. He continued back to Syria and Antioch. They met a guy named Apollos, who only had part of the story about Christ. Well, they explained to him the full story. And then Apollos was a man on fire. He boldly declared truth about Christ. And he was so good and so powerful as a preacher that when he wanted to go to the church in Corinth, the people there, the leaders in the church in Ephesus, highly endorsed him, and Apollos went to Corinth and became their next pastor. Do you see it? 
So you see how Aquila and Priscilla were involved? Good. Now let's go to Stephanus, 1 Corinthians chapter 1. Again, we already met Stephanus way back when, when we started this letter. Remember the first problem Paul had to address when he was writing this letter to the Corinthians? The problem where they were involved in all kinds of jealousy, creating little groups, saying, oh, my favorite preacher is Paul. No, my favorite preacher is Apollos, and so forth. Remember that? Well, again, verse 12, Paul was rebuking the church because of that. He said, I mean this. Each one of you is saying, well, I'm of Paul, or I'm of Apollos, or I'm of Cephas or Peter, or you know what? I don't need human teachers. I'm so spiritual. I'm of Christ. And then Paul said in verse 13, come on, guys, you're dividing the church of Christ. He goes, has Christ been divided? Um, he says, Paul was not crucified for you, was he? Those of you say, well, I'm, I'm a Paul. Paul wasn't crucified for you, was he? Or were you baptized in the name of Paul? No, you're baptized in the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, not in the name of Paul. Verse 14, Paul says, I thank God that when I was with you, Corinthians, that I baptized none of you except maybe Crispus and Gaius, so that no one would of you would say that you were baptized in my name. Can you imagine? You know, people walking around that church. Who were you baptized by? Oh, by Apollos? He's not an apostle. I was baptized by Paul. That makes me special and much better than you. Do you see it? That's why Paul says, I thank God that I baptized none of you except Crispus and Gaius so that no one of you would say that you were baptized in my name. And then verse 16, and then he remembers. He goes, well, I did baptize, here it is. I also baptized the household of Stephanus. But beyond that, I, don't know not, I do not know whether I baptized any other. So we see here, Stephanus was an early convert in that church in Corinth. But not just Stephanus. We are told his household. So there were numerous people in Stephanus' household, who heard the gospel preached by Paul, who were regenerated by God the Holy Spirit, made alive, they were given the gift of faith to be able to repent of their sins and to place their faith and trust in Christ alone. Stephanus and his household were some of the earliest believers or converts in that church. In fact, as we're going to see in a few moments when we get back to our text, Paul refers to them as the first fruits of his ministry in, in Corinth. So possibly they were the first believers there. So you have an idea of who this husband and wife team were, right? Aquila and Prisca. We also know who Stephanus was. Now, although we don't know exactly who Fortunatus and Achaicus were, perhaps they were two men who accompanied Stephanus when he carried the letter that the Corinthians wrote to Paul while Paul was in Ephesus, they wrote a letter because they had some questions. Remember chapter 7, verse 1? Paul says, now concerning the things about which you wrote, Paul was addressing their questions. Well, how did that letter that they wrote to Paul get to Paul? Well, I believe that it's plausible, very possible, that Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, members of the church in Corinth, they were the ones who carried this letter from the Corinthian church to Paul as he was serving on his third missionary journey there in Ephesus. Why do I say that? Let's go back to our text. 
1 Corinthians 16, verse 17, Paul said, as he closes his letter, I rejoice over the coming or arrival, while Paul was in Ephesus, of whom? Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus, because they have supplied what was lacking on your part possibly referring to the fact that they, when they arrived in Ephesus with the letter and all these questions they had, they also encouraged Paul saying, hey, let me tell you, maybe it's not quite as bad as you thought it was. Let me fill you in on what's going on and so forth. Paul says, they, verse 18, they refreshed my spirit and yours. Therefore, Paul says about these three men, he says to the Corinthian church, acknowledge such men show respect to, show honor to, which gives us a hint that these three men were in leadership positions in that church in Corinth, possibly elders who had been entrusted by the church in Corinth to carry their letter to Paul as he was serving there in Ephesus. Does that make sense? Okay, let's now put our text together. As Paul brings this letter to a close, he has a series of final commands to the church. Remember, this church was dealing with a ton of problems, right? I mean, this entire letter is literally a letter of rebuke. I mean, Paul starts out in chapter one, the first opening verses, he's positive, he's encouraging, and then he just gets into the rebuke. And there were a ton of things he needed to straighten out, right? Well, as Paul now brings this letter to a close, he has some final commands, some final imperatives for specific people in that church. Verses 13 and 14. First, for the men in that church. He says in verse 13 to them, be on the alert. In other words, be vigilant. Protect your minds from false teaching, including Greek philosophy that invaded that church. Protect yourselves, protect your loved ones, and protect the body of Christ. Men, be on the alert. Think of a soldier on the front lines. His head is constantly on a swivel. His eyes are darting back and forth. He is on the alert. Because if he gets lazy, he could get slaughtered. And men have the role of spiritual leadership in God's house, the church, and in their own homes. And men need to be on the alert, protecting themselves, protecting their loved ones, and protecting the bride of Christ. Why do you think Paul was giving this command to the men in the church? Because they were on the alert? No. Paul was giving them a command. Be on the alert. Second, stand firm in the faith. In other words, be uh, uh, steadfast in sound doctrine, in the faith, the body of truth revealed by God. Men need to be on the alert, protecting themselves, their loved ones, and the bride of Christ. Men need to be steadfast, firm, firmly grounded in the truth. They can't be tossed to and fro on every wind of doctrine. They need to protect the body of Christ. Be on the alert. Stand firm in the faith. Number three, act like men. Be mature. 
quit being boys. And fourth command, be strong. Be strong in the Lord. Again, I ask, why do you think Paul was giving these closing commands to the men in the church? Because they weren't doing this, right? And then verse 14, Paul gives them the balance. Yes, you need to be like a soldier on the alert. Yes, you need to be firm and steadfast in the body of truth. Yes, you need to act like men. Lead. And yes, you need to be strong in the Lord. But he says, verse 14, let all that you do be done in love. Love for Christ and love for the people of Christ. Do you see the balance? Strong, soldier-like, faithful, a protector, but also gentle, caring, and loving. This is the balance. And this only comes about, gentlemen, as you continue to sit under the Word of God, where the Holy Spirit performs on a daily basis what I call soul surgery. So that you're not lethargic, so that you're not lazy, and so that you are not acting like a boy. But rather, you're acting like a mature man. And isn't it interesting? God's definition of a mature man as opposed to the world's definition of a mature man, right? Mature man in the world's eyes, uh, financially successful, has 14 houses, 50 cars. You know, he's got all these employees. He's the, 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 the. God's definition. Mature man. He's alert. He's a protector. He's steadfast in the faith. Not only does he feed his soul when it comes to sound doctrine, he feeds the souls of those entrusted to his care with sound doctrine. He acts like a man and he's strong in the Lord and he balances all this with love. Love for Christ and love for the people of Christ. Paul was commanding the men in the church to wake up and start acting like men. Do you understand verses 13 and 14? Who Paul was speaking to and why? Well, then verses 15 through 18, Paul now turns to the congregation. He first commands the men now he speaks to the congregation. Verse 15, Now I urge you, brethren, he's talking to the body. And then in parentheses we read, he says, You know the household of Stephanus. Remember chapter 1, Paul had baptized Stephanus and his household. You know the household of Stephanus, that they were the first fruits of Achaia possibly the first converts there, or at least amongst the first converts in that church in Corinth when Paul was uh, there initially. He says, I urge you, brother, congregation. He says, you know the household of Stephanus. You know them. They're in your church. They're in the church there. You know the household of Stephanus, that they were the first fruits of Achaia and that they have devoted themselves for ministry or service to the saints. Stephanus and his household not only were saved by grace, they were serving the body of Christ out of gratitude for the grace they had received. And it wasn't just Stephanus. It was his household. Let me ask you a question. What kind of man do you think Stephanus was? What kind of leader? Good leader, right? Look at his influence. Look at his impact. 
on his household. Again, they have devoted themselves for ministry to the saints. They were serving the body there in Corinth. So Stephanus was acting like a man when it came to his personal family and when it came to God's family in the church. Stephanus was a leader in his home and in the church. And he influenced his household as well as God's household. And that's why Paul says in verse 16 to the congregation that they should be in subjection to such men like Stephanus and other men in his household who were acting like men. Why do you think Paul was saying to the congregation that they needed to be in subjection to such men? What was their problem? They weren't doing it, right? Listen, if you've got men acting like men, they're on the alert, they're steadfast in the faith, they're strong in the Lord, they're leading with love, you submit to them. You submit to their spiritual leadership because they're acting like men, like men whom God has put in position to lead. They're not leading as autocrats. They're not leading as dictators. They're not leading as, as bullies. Yes, they're strong. Yes, they're firm. But they're also loving. And Paul said to the congregation, think of Stephanus. Think of his household. Corinthian congregation, you need to start being in subjection to such men and quit acting like babies, like selfish babies and creating all kinds of chaos in that church. Do you see Paul's concluding comments? That you, verse 16, need to be in subjection to such men and to every man, everyone, every spiritual leader who helps and works and in the work and labors. Do you see it? If God in his grace appoints certain men to positions of spiritual leadership, the congregation is responsible to pray for these men, to encourage these men, to refresh these men, and to submit to these men because they care for your soul. And wives? You want to be in subjection to husbands that way, right? And hopefully, dads and moms, your example, can filter down into your household so that your children are impacted by, by that, just like Stephanus' household was, right? And then verse 17, Paul says, I rejoice over the coming of Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Achaicus. Again, he's talking about strong men in this context. So that's why I think these three men, even though we only know who Stephanus was, I think these three men were part of the men in that church who were acting like men, right? And they, therefore, had been responsible to, I believe, deliver the Corinthian letter to Paul, and Paul says they you are to because they've uh, I rejoice over the coming of Stephanus, Fortunatus, and Cacus, because they've supplied what was lacking on your part. They've refreshed my spirit and yours, and here it is. Therefore, he's saying to the congregation, acknowledge, respect, honor, bless such men. Do you see it? So verses 13 and 14. Paul hits the men in the church. Act like men. Verses 15 and through 18, Paul hits the congregation. If God has placed such men into your lives, submit to them. Bless them. Honor them. Do you see his closing comments? And then verses 19 through 24, uh, Paul gives a series of greetings. Verse 19, he says, the churches of Asia, Asia Minor, greet you. 
one of those churches. Paul was there in Ephesus. Paul says, the churches of Asia, Asia Minor, greet you. Aquila and Prisca greet you heartily in the Lord. Many of the people in the Corinthian congregation knew, personally knew, who Aquila and Priscilla were, right? Remember, they were there when Paul first arrived in Corinth. They stayed with him a year and a half. So Paul says, not only do the churches of Asia greet you, he says specifically, Aquila and Prisca greet you heartily in the Lord, along with the church that is in their house. Early churches were house churches. Well, Aquila and Priscilla, after Paul had left them there in Ephesus, founded a house church, right? So they had a church in their house. And Paul says, writing from Ephesus, hey, the church is here, greet you, so do Aquila and Priscilla, as well as the members of the church that meets in their house, that meet in their house. Verse 20, all the brethren greet you. And then he says, greet one another with a holy kiss. That was kind of like a common affectionate greeting back then amongst believers. Kind of like, you know, people come to church, you hug them. Maybe you give them a kiss on the cheek or on, on, the, on the, the forehead. I mean, obviously there was nothing sexual about it, this holy kiss. It was just a sign of affection, a sign of love, uh, a sign of respect in the Lord. And then Paul says, verse 21, the greeting, as he was closing this letter, is in my own hand, Paul. Uh, a lot of letters were flying around back then that were, um, that were not authentic. Letters that were written by phonies, yet they would say it was a letter, let's say, from Paul. Second, uh, Second Thessalonians is an example of that, okay? So Paul would often close out a, an authentic letter from him by, you know, grabbing the writing instrument. Usually he had what was called an amunensis, a writing scribe who was doing the writing of Paul's letters. But he would then, at the end of the letter, grab the writing instrument and he would write in his own hand writing the final greeting to authenticate that this letter was actually from Paul. So that's what Paul is doing here in verse 21. The greeting is in my own hand, Paul. Now, we're not sure. Maybe Paul wrote this entire letter. Maybe he didn't use an ambulances. Or maybe he just at this point grabbed the writing instrument and wrote this greeting. But regardless, we see Paul authenticating this letter. It was from him, obviously in the power of the Holy Spirit. And then verse 22. Paul says of the congregation, to everybody there, think of our context here. This was a crazy congregation, wasn't it? <laughs> Tons of problems. Paul closes out this letter, verse 22. He says to them, if anyone does not love the Lord, let him be accursed. The Greek word that Paul uses here for love is not what you would expect. You guys know I've taught you this many times. Uh, in the Greek, you had three different main words describing the word for love. Like in English, we only have one word, love. But in the Greek, you had different words. Uh, the highest, most supreme form of love, agape love, right? That's God's love. And that's our desire as believers to love God in that way with all our heart, mind, soul, and strength, agape love. So agape is the highest supreme love. Little lower than that is phileo love. Think of like brotherly affection. I like you a lot. Uh, Philadelphia is called the city of brotherly love, right? Phileo. So you have agape love, you have phileo love, and then you have what's called eros love or erotic love, which you understand. 
Now, it's interesting here in verse 22. Paul doesn't say, if anyone doesn't agape the Lord, or agapal the Lord, let him be accursed. He uses the word phileo. He says, if anyone does not even phileo the Lord, have affection for the Lord, in other words, some of you Corinthians who are causing all these problems in the church, you're a bunch of fakers. You're a bunch of hypocrites. You're using the name of the Lord and you're using your lips to say you love him, but you don't even phileo him. Will Jesus accept phileo love? Yeah. Think of Peter. When our Lord restored Peter, three times he asked Peter, do you love me? Do you love me? Do you love me? Interesting how our Lord had a play on words. First time, do you agapao me? Do you supremely love me? Well, Peter knew he couldn't say that because he had just a little earlier denied Christ three times. So he responds, Lord, you know I phileo you. Second time, Jesus says, do you agapao me? Peter, a second time, goes, Lord, I phileo you. And interestingly, both times, after Peter admits and is honest, Lord, I cannot love you supremely, but I have deep affection for you. Both times, our Lord says, now you're ready. Go feed my sheep. Go, go care for my lambs. Third time, Jesus says to Peter, Peter, do you really even phileo me all the time? And Peter was hurt. Why? Because our Lord nailed him. And Peter says, Lord, you know all things. And interestingly, our Lord said to Peter, go feed my sheep. See, Peter was then ready because Peter was broken and humbled and honest with himself and his Lord. Because earlier, the night Jesus was arrested, betrayed and arrested, Jesus had warned Peter, Peter, you better start praying. And Peter was, nah, I'm okay. Lord, even if everybody else denies you, I won't. <laughs> I'll die with you and die for you. How'd that work out? Not so well. Pride goes before a fall, right? No, well, Peter fell. But look how our Lord restored Peter. Peter needed to be honest with himself. Peter needed to be humble, contrite, so he could then be used by the Lord, right? So our Lord does accept phileo love, honest phileo love, as we pursue and strive and desire for agape love, obviously. When Paul here says, if anyone does not phileo the Lord, let him be accursed. Accursed in the Greek, anathema, devoted to destruction in hell. But of course, those people are a bunch of Judases. They're just playing a the game. They're a bunch of hypocrites hiding out in the church and poisoning the church. Think of that Corinthian church, right? And then Paul, at the end of verse 22, uses the Aramaic word, Maranatha. Come, Lord Jesus, or, or, oh Lord, come. Now, just keep your finger here. We're going to come right back. Go to Revelation. Let me see if you guys really get this. Go to Revelation chapter 22. At the end of the book of Revelation, verse 20, we see our Lord saying, yes, I am coming quickly. And then the response is, come Lord Jesus, Maranatha. That should be the cry of every believer. 
Come, Lord Jesus. I can't wait for your second coming. I can't wait for you to usher in the eternal state. Come, Lord Jesus. Come, Lord Jesus. Right? That is the cry of every true born-again believer's heart. Maranatha. We have this eager anticipation. Come, Lord Jesus. Right? Go back to Corinthians now. Let's see how, how good you are here at interpreting. Verse 22, think of the context. When Paul says, if anyone does not phileo the Lord, he is to be anathema, devoted to destruction and hell, accursed. And then Paul says, maranatha. What is Paul saying? Literally, come Lord Jesus. Why? Think about it. Is he saying, come Lord Jesus, your second coming? Obviously, Paul was eager, e eagerly anticipating that. We know that. But in this context, when he's uh, saying, come Lord Jesus, Maranatha, what is he wanting the Lord to come and do? Clean house in that church in Corinth. Come, Lord Jesus, and get rid of those who are faking. You know, the ones who do not even phileo you, even though with their lips, they give you all kinds of lip service. They are the ones poisoning that church. They are the ones causing all these problems in that church. Church, come, Lord Jesus, clean your house. It's very interesting. Paul here is asking the Lord to get rid of people. <laughs> right? <laughs> Because again, the Lord knows everybody's heart. He knows who the fakers are. He knows who the hypocrites are. Right? He knows those who've been planted there by the evil one. Paul's asking the Lord to purify his bride, which means get rid of the hypocrites. Paul's desire? The Lord's desire. A pure bride. Think of today in the modern church. What is the goal? Purify the church? Get rid of the hypocrites? Nope. Open the front doors as wide as possible and let everybody in and just create a comfortable environment where the hypocrites can hide. Do you see the difference? Back then, Lord, please purify your bride, Maranatha. Today, Lord, look how many people we can stuff into the building. Yes, we cannot talk about sin. We cannot talk about purity. We cannot talk about your truth because we don't want to offend them. Because if we, if we start actually bringing sound doctrine to them, they're going to run. And Lord, we don't want them to run because we want to stuff the building with as many people as we can. In fact, that then gives us the motivation to get more buildings and build our own empire. Let me ask you, which kind of church would you like to be a part of? One that pursues purity? And one that honors Christ? 
or one that never thinks of purity and is filled with a bunch of fakers who don't even phileo Christ. You want to be standing up and singing praise, praises to the Lord? Where you're surrounded by a bunch of people who hate the Lord? And are only coming because they're being, they're hearing things that just make them feel good and give them this comfortable condition to stay hypocrites. Verse 22, Paul says to the Corinthian church, if anyone does not phileo the Lord, Paul doesn't peck a person like that and keep tickling their ears and saying, it's okay, God loves you just the way you are. No, Paul says, you are to be devoted to destruction in hell. And then he cries out, Maranatha, come Lord Jesus, purify your bride. I know as a pastor, I'm praying for that all the time. Look, none of us are going to be perfectly pure on this side of heaven. We also have a sin nature, even those of us who are regenerated by grace, right? But nevertheless, we want to pursue purity in the power of the Spirit as together we study sound doctrine. We don't want to play games. We don't want to be hiding hypocrites thinking, okay, we're doing the religious thing on Sundays. Check. I'm okay in God's eyes. No, we do not want to create a place where sin can continue to spread like yeast and thus corrupt and impact and influence the body. We pursue purity. And again, we're all going to struggle, myself included. But nevertheless, because we love the Lord, we want to honor Him. We want to worship Him. We want to adore Him. We want to submit to Him and His Word. We want to submit to His design and desire for his church. Men need to act like men. The congregation needs to submit to men who act like men. And the entire congregation needs to have the same goal. Pursue purity for the glory of the Lord of the church. Right? And that's why church discipline is so vital because it helps maintain purity and unity and sound doctrine. Ultimately, Jesus Christ is the Lord of the church. And when he sees his body functioning the way he commands, you can count on the Lord of the church shepherding his church, building it and blessing it according to his will and for his glory. My job as a pastor is not to see how many people I can stuff into the building. That's easy. Just tell the people what they want to hear, give them what they want, You'll never have a problem getting a crowd because it's all about them. But that's not what Scripture tells us. And again, think about what we've been studying in this Corinthian church. Think of all that chaos. Do you want to be part of a body like that? <laughs>
I don't want to pastor a church. Whenever I get you know, a little frustrated with, with ministry, all I do is open up this letter and go, whoo, Lord, <laughs> thank you. I, I'm, oh, oh, I'm so blessed with the people that God has entrusted to my and our care. Uh, God, it's such a blessing. But nevertheless, as men, we've got to be on the alert. We can't get lazy. We've got to be steadfast in the faith. We need to act like men and be strong in the Lord and protect the body of Christ. And the body needs to submit to men who act like men, who are true spiritual leaders, so that together we're pursuing purity. As Paul says, if anyone doesn't fillet the Lord, he's to be accursed. Come, Lord Jesus, clean your house. And then verses 23 and 24, Paul concludes. He says to the Corinthians, the grace of the Lord Jesus be with you. And then Paul assures them, verse 24, my love be with you all. Paul loved them. Yeah, he had to hammer them in this letter. We understand why. And even here at the end, Severe warning, right? But Paul closes out, first of all, saying, may the Lord's grace be with you. And then he says, my love is with you all as well. My love be with you all in Christ Jesus. Amen. What a joy, what an honor, what a privilege, and what a blessing it is to be a part of the body of Christ. Think of the price that was paid to save your soul. Our Lord, the perfect one, was willing to be punished in our place for our sins, to die the death that we deserve. But three days later, rise in victory, overcoming sin and death for us. And through Jesus Christ, we have forgiveness of sins. Through Jesus Christ, we have the free gift of eternal life. And because of Christ, we have been baptized by Christ, by the means of the Spirit, into his body. A part of the body of Christ, the true church. And Christian we want to make sure that when Christ returns, when he sees his church, he sees a beautiful bride. Amen.